Okay, uh, now uh, let's continue with uh, our journey with our next speaker, Stefani Nikova, the team lead uh, uh, of the Can Do UI for Angular team at Progress. Uh, Stefani's professional background includes front-end technologies and uh, graphic design. Today, uh, she will share about one code base to rule them all. So, Stefani, welcome on stage. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining me for my first time on stage ever. I hope you enjoy it. Have you ever worked in a project which code base was scattered all over the place or had trouble managing the dependencies there? Even maybe questioned the way your repository um, repository is set up. Today, we are going to be diving into the JavaScript world of managing repositories. And more specifically, we are going to be focusing on two main approaches, the multi-repository versus the monorepository. In short, multi-repository means that each individual project lives in its own separate repository, while monorepository, on the other hand, means that the entire code lives in one place. But before we continue exploring the nuances of those approaches, I just wanted to know that for me, it's the, the best way to gain those practical insights is by having the chance to personally experience them. And luckily, over the years, I had the chance to work in various talented teams uh, with projects that have different complexities. And especially my last few years at Progress um, have led me to look closely at how workflows can be optimized and more specifically, how the repositories can be managed. Um, Let's look at Can Do UI for Angular. Some of you may have heard of it. Others maybe even have used it. While maybe there are some of you that might be asking yourself, wasn't Can Do a Japanese martial art, and what does it have to do with Angular? Well, you're right. But in the JavaScript world, Can Do UI is also known to be a web components library. and. Also, um, my team specializes in the Angular domain of it. This is our mascot, the Kendoka. Some of you maybe have met it already outside. If you haven't, you can search for it and maybe take a photo or two. Um, we have been around since 2016. Nowadays, we have more than 120 components, which prior to the migration, uh, were scattered across about 50 or so repositories. And we currently have about 13 people on the team with a couple of uh, friendly neighborhood guys that are pitching in when we need them. Back in 2016, what was important for the team and the product was that each project lived in its own space uh, which meant cleaner code base and separation of concerns. It was also important that each one of the libraries can be released independently, which made the continuous delivery process uh, more flexible. And all of this also meant faster build times for us, which were great. But over the years, as the number of components grew, the library started expanding, um, different kind of problems started emerging. On top of our list was how to handle the dependencies and in a way that is optimal, let's say. We uh, really needed to be careful that we don't end up with uh, different libraries needing uh, different versions of one and the same dependency. 
we were also risking um, falling behind on updates and missing important features. I still remember that we had those long lists listing uh, all of the repositories we had and the checkboxes next to them. And we had to go and uh, make sure that we went through each one, apply the update there, and everything is good. And the lack of visibility of what was really going on, which version its dependency where, was uh, really, really starting to uh, get obvious. To illustrate what I mean, take a look at our dependency graph. Um, you can't even see it, right? Uh, let alone manage it effectively. Uh, so having that many repositories naturally meant that we were dealing with an overhead of setting up the environments, um, managing uh, issues, and dealing with um, a lot of pull requests. For example, if we wanted to make a common change everywhere, that meant 50 or so pull requests, depending on the number of repositories. And Consequently, that meant having 150 builds. Why three? Because we had uh, the build runs on each one of the main branches that is part of the process until it gets to production. Um, another issue that we have is that we didn't only needed to make sure that the update went everywhere, but when there was a change, we needed to ensure comprehensive testing across all repositories. Um, that meant that it wasn't only enough to test if the change is OK in the respective repository where it was made, for example, an inputs package, but we have to go and check each one of the packages that depends on that particular one, which sometimes, honestly, we missed some of those stuff. And it was a bit too late until we figured it out. By the end, the entire release process has become a very carefully orchestrated chaos, I would say. We needed to make sure which library should be released first, then maybe go and update some dependencies and release the another library, and so on. Um, all these problems, they didn't uh, come all at once, and they weren't so bad at the beginning. There were times, as time passed by, that we told ourselves, well, it is getting worse, maybe, a monorepository can help us in this case. But at, at moments, we also told ourselves, well, we don't have the resources now. Maybe it's not that worth it. It isn't so bad. So we didn't commit to doing it. But at some point, it uh, started costing us a lot of resources, a lot of time, and we became really error prone. So this is the time when we told ourselves, well, let's do it right now. A few important things to note, should you decide to uh, go through such a migration or perhaps any kind of migration, make sure that at the beginning you assess your project and its needs very carefully and you evaluate the tools that are out there then adopt a um, phased approach and incrementally migrate the project, not everything all at once, because that will allow you to fine-tune the process. And have in mind that there will be a learning curve for your team, but it's, it's not that bad, and they will eventually adapt. So about three months, seven actively dedicated developers and God knows how many dev hours later, our monorepository was born. Everything was great. We 
have a really lightened dependency management process because all of the libraries now had one version and we, it was easier for us to ensure the compatibility. The environment was now only one and it was easier to maintain good practices, standards, setup, configuration and so on. My personal favorite is that now it was easier than ever to make common changes. Remember the 50 pull requests from earlier? Well, now all of these could be done with just one, which was great. Uh, as a bonus, in my opinion, we also managed to make um, our code more visible or more easily findable by other teams in our organizations that uh, are using um, our product. And if they needed to look for something, they knew where to look. There was one place where our product lived. And the internal collaboration was also increased. The team started sharing um, a sense of um, unity as everything was in one place, and they gained better cross-component understanding. However, as is in real life, not everything is always good. It's not always sugar spice and everything nice, as much as we want it to. Um, as much as our uh, dependency management was simplified and all of the other good things happened, now we started facing a different kind of problems. With everything moving to one place uh, and with the code starting to grow exponentially and all of the tests and all of the packages moving to one place, inevitably that meant that the build times and the time needed for testing started increasing, uh, I mean, a lot. And in order to fix that, the pipeline perhaps needed to figure out, wait, what was changed? Do I need to run, do I need to build all of the libraries? Do I need to run all of the tests? I'm not going to run everything just because someone made a change somewhere in the, uh, in the repository, because that would just be insane, right? Uh, this is where NX came to our rescue. NX is a process build tool that we use to set up our repository. Uh, it is free if you have your own infrastructure and if you need to use the cloud services, um, it has some sort of subscription based. But uh, well, luckily we have our own infrastructure and um, we are using the free version. Two really great features of NX that helped us with the build times and the testing duration is that it is really smart and knows that when some part of the code was run, um, it didn't need to run it. It didn't need to run it again, and it could take uh, it could take it from its cache. And it was also able to track down the dependency graph, what are the affected parts of your code, and only run new builds and tests only for those parts. Let me try and illustrate this with an example. In Kendo UI for Angular, we have thousands of tests. And instead of building only one library, it was building around 50, maybe more now. If we were to run all of these tests and build at once, that would mean having a build an hour and a half or so, which is just unacceptable. We cannot live with that. When we enabled those optimization techniques that NX offered us, we were able to decrease the number of tests, as you see on the top, that were run. Um, only for the specific part of the code. And the build time was also reduced to about 50 or so minutes. 
But that wasn't good enough, right? Because 50 minutes is still a lot. In order to deal with that, we introduced parallel processing on two separate levels. First, we split um, our build in four different parts that could run independently of each other, which allowed us, which allowed them to start all at the same time without having idle time at the beginning. Uh, the only thing was that they had all one common part that was repeated in each one of them, and that is they needed their containers to be set up because they were running on different machines, and they needed to install the uh, node modules. That took about a minute and a half, two minutes, which wasn't that bad, and compared to the overall reduction that we got, we could live with that. Um, because the end-to-end -end tests don't need to wait for the packages to be built. They just need a running sample application, right? And they could easily be run separately. And on a second level, again, NX uh, offers its own parallel processing that allows you to, again, run processes simultaneously at the same time. And for example, you don't need um, to wait for each test to start with the next one, which allowed us to use that feature. As you see, the overall time was reduced to about 18 minutes, which was great for, in comparison to the hour and a half that we started with. And I have taken out those statistics for a relatively big package that um, is a dependency for a lot of packages. And for smaller packages, the results were even better. Um, that wasn't the only thing that was on our radar. And as much as collaboration was improved after going to working in one shared code space, it also introduced other, other difficulties. You see, collaboration is a two-way street. And when all the people start working in the same space, suddenly a lot of pull requests start popping up everywhere. Uh, two, ways, two things helped us in this situation. The first one, of course, is um, better communication between the people in the team. And even sometimes um, there was one person that said, OK, let me just put everything in order. Let me see what's going on. I'll handle that so that not a lot of people try to merge their pull requests all at once. But around that time, also, the GitHub merge queue was introduced, which was great for our case because it took part of all of that to take the pull requests that are ready to be merged, put them in order, and handle that. Unless there are conflicts that it cannot resolve, then a human needs to interact with it. But have in mind that our team was, is relatively small, and this is working great for us for now. But if you were talking for twice as many or even more people, probably that would be an entirely different conversation. At the end of it all, with one mono repository, we also got a single version number for each one of the components. Um, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that at the beginning of when the library was created, it was important that each library had its own semantic version link releases. Well, now everything needed to be aligned and have one and the same version. The downside of this is that if there is a change in just one of the packages and its version needs to be updated, that automatically means that the version is increased for all of the other libraries as well, regardless 
uh, of if there is a change there or not. This is kind of um, making the process a little bit a little bit more rigid and might might confuse someone that there is a new version. Maybe there is something new in that library, but that's not necessarily the truth. However, we decided to look on the bright side of this because in the past we have received uh, many times feedback from our clients that actually having so many different versions was confusing for them as well and it was hard for them to manage their own dependencies of our packages. It was hard to track when uh, a new version which, which is the latest version, what are the new things, and so on. And also, additionally, the unified version opened up for us the possibility to create a unified, uh, to create a documentation versioning, which is also something that our clients have been requesting in the past. But we still haven't done that. <laughs> it's just a possibility for us at the moment. So, for us, monorepo really works, and it is great. I bet, depending on the type of team and the project, the challenges may vary, but they definitely will be there. And before you go and decide to merge everything in a monorepo, just ask, your, ask yourself first, what problems am I trying to solve? And is monorepo really the decision? If it is, go ahead and do it. But just keep in mind that, as is in real life, there are no perfect um, solutions in software development as well and be prepared to handle and deal with the trade-offs. But just be bold, be informed, ask questions. Don't be afraid to challenge the existing, because maybe not a perfect, but a better solution is out there. Thank you. Okay, any quick questions? No? Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you.